Dr. Stephanie Walker from New York State University. Um, she is a professor and extension uh, vegetable specialist at New York State. So we're very honored to have you here today. I'm so far away. <laughs> Thank you. Um, she'll be giving a presentation on our state's most iconic symbol, the chili pepper. Um, before we begin, in front of you are surveys. Please fill them out. They help us be more pronounced in this one. So it'd really be awesome for you guys to fill it out at the end of the presentation. Um, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Stephanie Walker. So yes, I'm the extension vegetable specialist. So what is an extension vegetable specialist? Well, basically it means I'm supposed to get out research-based information about growing vegetables. And of course, here in New Mexico, chili is one of our two biggest vegetables, along with onions. Uh, onions are about the same uh, economically uh, in importance, but of course, chilies are near and dear to our hearts. I'm also now the co-director of the Chili Pepper Institute. So for this talk, uh, you reached out to the Chili Pepper Institute. So, uh, so here we are. So chili peppers have a very long historic uh, significance here in the state. Before I get into that, let's do some basics here. Chili peppers are in the Solanaceae family, uh, nightshade, so they're closely related to tomatoes, eggplants, and potatoes. Uh, there are five domesticated species. So capsicum annum is the main species that we grow here in the United States and throughout the world. If you like a Tabasco sauce, that's frutescens, capsicum frutescens. If you like the super hot ghost peppers that will just like uh, really knock you for a loop, uh, those are mainly capsicum chinitzi. And the capsicum bacatum is primarily grown and loved out of South America. Uh, capsicum pubescens is the last, and that's mainly grown uh, in, in South America. Uh, capsicum anima, of course, includes our New Mexico chilies, as well as jalapenos, uh, bell peppers, and uh, many other chilies that we're very familiar with here in the United States. Now, for chili peppers, where did they come from? Chili peppers truly are a new world crop. So they had their origins down in South America, near the border of Bolivia and Brazil. And uh, wild chili peppers are very small, red berry-like uh, fruit that grow upright on top of the plant. So birds love to see these bright red fruit. They'll grab them, they'll eat them, uh, they digest them, they fly off. Uh, the seed is not damaged through the bird's digestive tract, so when the birds go and do their business, they drop the seed along with some fertilizers, some great start uh, to get those chili plants growing. So they're called bird peppers for that reason. And an additional bonus is the birds do not feel the heat or the pungency. They don't have the same receptors in their, their, their palate, <laughs> their piece. Uh, mammals, of course, feel this heat. So birds are not getting the heat. It doesn't bother them. But you know, we believe that chili peppers evolved the heat to basically prevent mammals from eating them. So of course, humans are one crazy mammal that learned to love that heat, though. So, uh, so we, of course, uh, started introducing chili peppers to our diets a very long time ago. Uh, this is a picture of some of the wild chili peppers that are still harvested as a crop. Uh, chili piquin, uh, they're small round, about a quarter inch diameter. They're very, very hot. So if you're not a bird and you can taste the heat, it's going to definitely uh, wake up your taste buds. Uh, germinating these seeds can be a challenge, so actually when the seeds are scarified through the bird's digestive tract, it actually helps them ger enhance their germination. And if you want to find wild chiltepine plants, you can still find them in southern Texas and southern Arizona, but they don't get really freeze events. So those plants are established, uh, they persist. Peppers were discovered by humans a very, very long time ago. Uh, historical records, archaeological records show about 7,000 BC. And initially, of course, humans used them as a medicinal plant, which we still do today. So we know chili peppers, uh, they cause numbness. So if you have a pain, such as a toothache, uh, you can put a little bit of chili pepper on there. It will help dull the pain. Also, when we experience the pain of eating chili peppers, that causes our brains to release endorphins. These are, these are chemicals that just make us feel good and not mind the pain so much. So the Mayans used chili peppers to treat asthma, coughs, and sore throats. Uh, the Aztecs to relieve toothaches. And so in general, uh, these were medicine that early, our early human ancestors used. Now, initially, of course, chili was a weed. It was just growing wild. And uh, humans would go and gather fruit from the wild plants once the fruit turned red. And uh, 
It didn't take them long, though, before they realized, hey, we can actually start saving these seed ourselves so we can plant these plants and know that we'll have a harvest of our chili peppers. So chili peppers are one of the first uh, species that was domesticated by humans. So uh, out of the 32 wild species that have currently been identified, the five species I mentioned earlier were domesticated by humans. The domestication occurred uh, several times over the history of uh, humanity here. And the oldest evidence of domesticated children where humans were actually selecting for the fruit characteristics they liked uh, was in the Tehuacan Valley of South Central, Central Mexico. So, so think, of the, think about yourself. Okay, you have these wild chili plants, and you want to select plants that have fruit that you like better. So what are you going to select for? We don't want these tiny little fruit, right? So we're going to start selecting for larger fruit. Uh, we don't want those fruit to fall off of the plants before we can harvest them. So we want the fruit that are going to stick on the plants better. Uh, and of course, once these fruit get bigger, they're going to be pendant instead of sticking up where the birds could easily grab them. So once you have this big fruit that's strongly attached to the plant and sticking down, not too many birds can come up, grab that fruit <laughs> and fly off. So at this point, chili peppers were relying on humans to save and spread the seed. So how did capsicum find its way around the world? So we know that Asian food, Indian food, uh, China is a huge producer of chili peppers. You know, many of these areas love chili peppers, they, their chili peppers, as much as we love our chili peppers here in New Mexico. But they didn't have chili peppers until uh, Christopher Columbus's first uh, voyage here to the New World. So this was one benefit, beneficial thing he did, was he took a lot of the, the crops that he discovered in the New World, that he had discovered, <laughs> so he thought, and brought them back to the Old World. So Columbus wrote, this was New Year's Day, 1493, when Christopher Columbus discovered the chili peppers. Uh, he said, of course, he was a great marketer. He had to make sure that the queen thought that he, he did great work, was going to give him more money for his voyages. But he said, the pepper which the local Indians use as a spice is more abundant and even better than the black pepper which he was actually looking for. <laughs> so I would agree with that. I'm not sure if he felt that way, but that's certainly what he... Uh, the word he wanted to spread. Chili peppers moved rapidly through Europe and Asia once it reached the Old World. Uh, Christopher Columbus wanted to collect as much as possible. Uh, of course, at the time, he thought because he was getting that pungency, similar somewhat to what you get when you eat black pepper, he thought it was just another type of black pepper, so he called it red pepper. It's actually a completely different genus and species. So. Yeah, totally different, uh, different beast. Uh, but when it's used, there's no, no need for the Caucasian pepper or the black pepper. So this uh, very quickly, these very bland diets that people in, in Europe and throughout the world were eating at the time were suddenly spiced up. You know, we know that adding chili peppers really adds, enhances the flavor and the overall appeal of eating many products, except for those of you who really don't like chili. <laughs> so, but I think most of us do like it at some degree of heat. So now the largest producers of capsicum, so when I say capsicum, I mean chili peppers. Uh, China, Mexico, Turkey, and Indonesia all actually produce more than the United States. Uh, in 2017, chili peppers on a global scale are worth more than coffee and tea. So that's how critical this crop is throughout the world. So here in New Mexico, though, we love our chili peppers, right? <laughs> I, think, I think I can speak for most of us, certainly. So New Mexico is the largest producer of chili peppers in the United States. So by chili peppers, I'm talking about peppers that actually make the pungency. So bell peppers are also capsicum anum. They're the same genus and species, but uh, other states like California and Florida grow a lot of bell peppers. When it comes to the spicy, flavorful type, though, New Mexico is number one. So we do, uh, it's, been, it's been grown here for a very, very long time. And of course, it's so important to the state that we did proclaim it uh, the official state vegetable in 1965. And we're one of the few states that has an official state question, red or green. They don't mention Christmas in that, but I know many of us like Christmas so even better. 
So it has been cultivated in this part of the world for hundreds of years. So it's a, chili peppers were well established here long before New Mexico became a state. Now, how did chili peppers get through New Mexico? As I mentioned, it had its origins down in South America. But we don't know, we know that some of the native tribes did trade seed up and down the uh, Rio Grande Corridor here in the state. Uh, we don't have any written records, though, until the Spanish explorers first came to this part of the world. So we believe that chili pepper seed was first brought up here in the 1582 to 83 uh, Espejo expedition. We know that uh, Baltasar Obregon uh, wrote, wrote in his diary, they have no chili, but the natives were given some seed to plant. So we do know that by 1601, for sure, we have written, written verification that chili pepper seed was being grown here in, in what is now New Mexico. Now, chili peppers, of course, need irrigation. So one wonderful thing that the early uh, Spanish explorers and uh, introduced was the acequia system. Uh, the acequia system is still actively used today, and it's a system of gravity-fed earthen canals that basically bring water to their chili fields and other crop fields to produce other vegetables and, uh, and grains and such, corn. Uh, this did allow for increased crop production, including chili. And like I said, these are still actively used. Uh, this was a way to keep their uh, their agriculture going in northern New Mexico. So because of this early seed that was introduced, we have many different uh, native land-raised chilies. So native, native chilies, uh, who's familiar with Chimayo chili? A couple, yeah, a couple folks. So, so Chimayo chili is very genetically distinctive compared to the long green types that New Mexico is primarily known for because of the production scale we have in the southern part of the state. But what happened is various communities, families got some chili seed, and over more than 400 years by selecting the plants that they like the heat level, they like the flavor, they like the productivity of the plants best, they actually developed their own specific unique land race type. These are usually a short, thin walled, a shorter fruit, they tend to be very hot, and they tend to be very early maturing. So as a chili breeder, this is something that's really interesting to us because uh, they germinate so quickly and they give you fruit so quickly. So it's a great trait of early maturity that many of us have tried crossing into the New Mexico types. And now it, it contributes to the cultural identity of many of these Hispanic communities uh, up in northern New Mexico. So Chimayo is one of the most famous, and if you eat Chimayo chili, if it's truly Chimayo chili, I always hear reports that people take Sandy and try to pass it off <laughs> as Chimayo, but it, uh, it garners twice the price at the farmer's market. And it does have a very unique flavor. The capsaicin, uh, the, the heat profile is different on these than the New Mexico chili that's much more well known. So just quickly, uh, I'm always asked, so what, is it, what do you mean by a land race? So this is just a quick rundown about what I mean by a land race. If I call it a cultivar, that means cultivated variety, and it's basically something new that's been stabilized, or a new hybrid that's been made fairly recently. An heirloom, we all know about heirloom tomatoes. Well, many of our New Mexico chilies are now heirlooms too. And these are seed that has been kept by a community, a family, and uh, basically uh, pro propagated year after year because the, the quality is really beloved by that community or family. A land race, however, has been grown in an area for more than 100 years, and just by saving seed from the plants that survive and do best in that specific region or area, you're really selecting for plants that are very well adapted for the conditions in that particular spot. So with the New Mexico land race chili, uh, most of the families now will collect and save their own seed. And like I said, this is a, a basic breeding technique. This is the way chili was first domesticated, by families saving the seed from all the pods that dried. Only the plants that reached a mature, maturity, survived any diseases or stresses, actually lived to give them more seed. So like I say, you're adapting that variety for that particular area. So we have done a lot of trials at New Mexico State, uh, inland race varieties. 
and we found that uh, although there's some great qualities there, a lot of them are really mixed up. So if you plant them, you might get some plants that have short fruit, others that have longer fruit. And unfortunately, that's because when people were saving their own seed for a long time, they didn't realize when they started growing bell peppers or when jalapenos were first introduced to the community, uh, these plants will actually cross-pollinate. And so very quickly, you're going to mess up your genetics of your seed source and you have outcrossing going off the chili plants. So let's move on now to New Mexico type chili. Like I said, this is very different and genetically distinct from the land races. And we are very proud to say that our New Mexico type chili was first developed and introduced by Fabian Garcia. Now Fabian Garcia is the father of really agriculture here in New Mexico. He was an amazing man did a lot of great things to further agriculture in what's now New Mexico. So we had some of those same mixed up land races growing, and Fabian Garcia thought, well, wait a second, if we get something that's a little bit more consistent and predictable, you know, if you grow this, you'll know whether you're getting long or short fruit, uh, maybe make them a little bit milder uh, to appeal to a larger segment of the population. Uh, maybe we can really grow this chili industry. So he took some of the land races and began a selective breeding program. And through his work, he developed New Mexico Number no. 9, which was the first long green New Mexico type. Now, I will, I'm, I'm going to definitely put a disclaimer in here. <laughs> How many of you have heard of the term Anaheim peppers? Everybody. <laughs> so how about New Mexico type? Not so much. In fact, it drives me crazy whenever I get a, a very reputable seed catalog and New Mexico type peppers are referred to as Anaheim. Well, that's wrong. <laughs> so back when Fabian Garcia was first doing his selection work, he was visited by a gentleman named Gilberto Ortega, who was amazed by these wonderful chili lines that Fabian Garcia had. So he thought, this is great stuff. I have some seed. Fabian Garcia let him take some seed back to California in An what is now Anaheim. <laughs> Uh, Gilberto Ortega, who actually is the namesake of the Ortega Chili Company, began his own breeding work. So Anaheim Chili really has its origins with New Mexico. So it's been one of my uh, great jobs as extension vegetable specialist to get the word out that Anaheim are actually varieties of New Mexico type chili and not vice versa. <laughs> Another big uh, misnomer, or somewhat misnomer, how many of you have heard these chilies referred to as hatch chili? Everybody, right. So there is no hatch chili. What a hatch chili is really any one of these New Mexico type chilies that's grown in the hatch area. And just the community of hatch, it's a small community, 30 minutes north of, of Las Cruces, they grow great chili. There's some amazing growers there, but there is no hatch, hatch chili. Hatch is New Mexico green chili grown in hatch. But uh, the community members of Hatch, I mean, they were you know, quite brilliant at kind of getting that marketing behind them. We'll talk a little bit more about that here shortly. But just more of the historical significance, uh, the very first scientifically based research article by Fabian Garcia came out in 1929 called Demand for Chile is on the Increase. And it hasn't slowed down since then. We also have uh, the first recorded incident. <laughs> so this is a horrible disease of chili worldwide. We have the worst Phytophthora chili wilt here in New Mexico, the worst strains. If you see a bell pepper that's said to be resistant to chili wilt, if we put it in New Mexico, our chili wilt uh, strains will take it out. But it was first identified here back in 1922 by a very famous pathologist. <laughs> it's still dogs as we also have artwork. Uh, this is actually a fresco that's in our biology building down in New Mexico State University campus uh, that is entitled The Chili Wilt. <laughs> so we're actually getting some dying chili plants and uh, appreciating them, them for their artistic value, which as a grower, we never appreciate seeing that right, right up on this. No. <laughs> okay, so. We had the same problem in the southern part of the state that they had up in the northern part of the state when they put in the Acequia water system to get water to our chili plots. Uh, in the southern part of the state, we have the Rio Grande flooding it to it, but before the Elephant Butte Dam was built, the fields would flood out regularly. So, you know, obviously if you're going to curl your work into growing your chili fields, 
and suddenly you have a flood event that really dissuades you from an increasing production. So the elephant feed dam helped regulate that water so that farmers could deliver it to the fields and the amount they needed without worrying about the crops being uh, wiped out. And so that's when a gentleman named Joseph Franzoy, who's known as the commercial, uh, commercial chili father, uh, grandfather, <laughs> he began farming in the Hatch Valley in 1918. So he really liked this New Mexico 9 that Fabi and Garcia released. Uh, it took him a little while to warm up to chili peppers, but once he got, got accustomed to the heat and the flavor, he realized that they grew really, really well. This, germ, this genetics, these cultivars from New Mexico State University were predictable and great. So he started commercially producing this. And they actually organized the first Hatch Chili Festival in 1971. So it hasn't been going on. I guess 1971 was pretty long ago. <laughs> but this festival is held every Labor Day weekend. And people from throughout the world descend on Hatch to go to this festival. So, so if you really are a, a chili head, that you really want to get into this, you can go to Hatch to visit this uh, Labor Day. Uh, 2020 was the only year since 1971 that had been canceled because of the pandemic that upended so much of our lives. So this is why we know, call it Hatch Chili, because Hatch has marketed themselves very, very well. So um, once we had this production one, we had canneries become established. When we had the canneries, we're, we're further processing the chili so it could be shipped long distances. Then the farmers increased production to uh, supply the canneries. And that's how we really started this amazing commercial industry that we have here in the state now. Uh, Roy Nakayama was another uh, very famous chili breeder at New Mexico State University. We've had a chili breeder there since Bobby and Garcia's time. So it is the longest publicly run a breeding program for chili peppers right at New Mexico State University. So he continued to work on the New Mexico chili varieties to get a better, better size, a better flavor, more regulated heat. And he actually worked with a farming family in Hatch, the Lytles, to develop Big Jim. So Big Jim is a very famous chili. He also released an Espanol improved in Arnaki, uh, two additional popular New Mexico type chili varieties. Here's a picture of Big Jim. Uh, at the time, the cultivars that were being grown had, had smaller fruit. And if you want a really good chili rano, you can stuff lots of chili in. Of course, you want a really big fruit. Well, uh, Big Jim actually holds the world's record for the largest chili pepper, so longest chili pepper. So he did collaborate with this farming family in Hatch, and Big Jim was actually named after the farmer, Jim, Jim Lytle. Another one of his releases, Espanol Improved, has been in the news recently. Uh, this was just grown on the International Space Station, much to the delight of the astronauts who got to make uh, their dish with fresh chili. <laughs> if you haven't seen this, it's uh, when you're in space eating powdered food, freeze-dried food, adding some fresh chili to your diet is a great bonus. Uh, Paul Bosson, uh, this was a breeder who retired just recently. Uh, and he actually founded the Chili Pepper Institute. So what is the Chili Pepper Institute up here representing it? It's really, it uh, was put in place because of just the amazing amount of questions, requests for tours, requests for information that came to New Mexico State University. So we're the largest internationally nonprofit uh, organization that studies and disseminates chili information. So if you want to buy chili seed, if you want to buy other chili paraphernalia, you can go to the online store. Uh, we also have a yearly New Mexico Chili Conference in Las Cruces. That's the first Tuesday every, every February. So he also released many popular New Mexico type chili cultivars, including a New Mexico Joe Parker, a medium chili, and a Sandia Select, a nice hot, a thicker meated chili. So chili peppers, of course, they're, they're valued for their pungency and their flavor. Uh, the flavor uh, comes from, or much of the, the distinctive heat uh, comes from the capsaicin chemicals. So capsaicin is actually the chemicals that give chili heat. Uh, the bright red colors that we usually see in mature a chili fruit come from two very uh, unique red pigments. Uh, capsarubin is a brownish red pigment. 
cat scent and is a brick red pigment. So heat, the capsaicin, and closely related chemicals. These are alkaline oily chemicals. So if you have eaten a hot chili and want to get it out of your mouth, remember this is an oily, it's an oil. So basically uh, dissolving in fat, uh, ice cream or alcohol. So usually some nice ice cream or, or beer or alcohol is the best way to dissipate heat. If you just use water, it just basically spreads it around. So this is unique to capsicums. You don't find caps, capsaicin produced in any other plant anywhere in the, in the native, uh, natural world. It's mainly produced in the veins. So many people incorrectly think the seeds are the hottest part. The seeds actually do not contain any of this capsaicin chemical. Where you'll get the heat is in the, you see the yellow veins there? So that's where the heat is being, the capsaicin is being expressed. So if you want to taste a chili fruit without getting the heat, just bite off the tip of an undamaged fruit below where those veins travel and you'll just get the flavor, no heat. Then you give the second bite to your friend. <laughs> you make it tell you how hot it was. <laughs> so the chili color, uh, actually the, these unique red pigments have actually proven to be a valuable source of natural red food color. You know, many years ago, back in the 70s, a long, long time ago, <laughs> we, uh, we had a, an artificial uh, red color that was proven to be a carcinogen. So we had to stop using this artificial red dye, and people started using chili peppers. So you take these chili peppers, they're very high in these red pigments. Uh, the pigments are extracted into what's called oleoresin uh, uh, paprika, and then it's actually used to color a wide variety of products. If you, Nacho cheese, Doritos, pepperoni. Uh, it's even used to feed uh, to, don't have the picture, flamingos in the zoo. If they're not used to eating a natural diet, they go white. So zoos will feed them paprika to keep them reddish. So here in New Mexico, as I said, our state question is red or green. And, and you know, I, will, I have had so many people touring with me out in the field they're absolutely amazed when they see a green and a red fruit on the same plant. <laughs> it's amazing what you're doing with chili these days. So actually, for the most part, with New Mexico types, the chili will start out green. Uh, when it's in the green stage, it's not mature yet, so the seed won't germinate from a green fruit. If you leave it on the plant long enough, it's going to turn red and then it's physiologically mature. Uh, before the uh, mid-1980s, you know, most of the varieties used were dual purpose, so a farmer would harvest the green fruit off, then leave the last fruit on there to harvest as red. Now the problem with this is a, gr a good green cultivar doesn't really work for a good red cultivar, and a good red cultivar isn't good for a good green cultivar. That's because these industries are very different. So here in New Mexico, we really have three main chili pepper industries. We have the red industry, uh, the green industry and cayenne peppers, which are actually, uh, it's a fermented product like Tabasco sauce, but it, it's shipped to Louisiana, they call it Louisiana hot sauce with our New Mexico cayenne peppers. Yeah, Anaheim gets, gets credit for our great, great material, <laughs> Louisiana gets credit for our great material, it's just not right. Yeah, we have to stand up for New Mexico's uh, notoriety. So here's the breakdown in acreage. We don't have very much acreage of the cayenne. Most of the acreage is red chili, although we are losing a lot of this to Mexico. It's pretty much about half and half now with the green and red acreage. So with our red chili crop, the vast majority is dried down. So it's dried down. A big chunk of that is used to get that oleoresin paprika, that natural red food coloring. Uh, here's a big uh, drying, uh, drying operation. Uh, ASTA, the, so the ASTA stands for American Trade Association. This is just the measurement of how much red you have in there, how much pigment is actually in that chili pepper. Uh, we also want red chilies that dry easily. And if you want, if you're going to dry this, you don't want to put a lot of energy into drying this fruit. And of course, uh, if you're using this as a food color, you don't want it to be hot. So we want these very, very low pungency. And unless you know that you're getting those fiery Cheetos, <laughs> you, you want it to be mild or, or non-pungent. So through most of the world currently, most of the red chili is grown on, or dried on ditch banks or rooftops. 
And historically, this is the way it was done in New Mexico as well. Uh, but of course, with uh, sanit sanitation, you know, you have critters, you have birds flying above. So that's that and also the capacity of really spurred the uh, implementation of these commercial dryers, either tunnel dryers or continuous belt dryers, to dry a lot of red chili very quickly. So green chili, with our green chili crop, it's harvested when it's fully sized, so it's not quite red yet, it's just about ready to turn red, um, but it's still, still immature. It's usually uh, processed by steam peeling, and then it's quickly frozen or, uh, or canned, or we have a very large fresh market. In fact, I'm going to point out Evelyn Ledbetter here. Her, her and her husband grow the best green chili. You don't have to go to Hatch to get amazing, wonderful <laughs> New Mexico type green chili. You have a wonderful grower right here in Portales. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 22 years of farmer's markets. So we do about 20 acres of four varieties. So green chili is 100% hand harvested still. And that's a problem because farmers are having a lot of trouble getting, getting enough people out in the field to pick all their chili. You know, you have a big green chili ready to be picked. It can take hundreds of people out there uh, picking. And we've had a lot of trouble with people not wanting to take those jobs anymore. And so acreage here has declined. So acreage has to plant partially because we have higher yielding varieties, so we need fewer acres, but also because the growers just can't really get the manual labor to get the crop out. So this all was for when NAFTA came in. It made things even more competitive for local chili growers. And so for any fruit or vegetable, if we're relying on hand labor, it's really hard to compete with many other countries throughout the world. And so it's kind of mechanized these crops. So back, uh, how am I doing at time? I feel like I'm running long. Two four. Two four. Okay. So we had the Bracero program uh, that was actually put in place back during World War II. You know, so many residents here in the United States were off fighting the war, so they really had a labor shortage then as well. So this was a guest worker program. Four nationals came in uh, to work on the farms. Uh, for a on a temporary basis. It was originally scheduled to get end shortly after World War II, uh, but farmers still needed this help, so really the, the program was extended uh, a couple times. Uh, however, because farmers were worried they were going to lose all their, their wonderful help on the farms, they said, hey, we need to figure out how to mechanically harvest this stuff, or we're going to have to stop growing chili. So, so we did have a very early um, investigation about how to harvest chili. This was, I was really proud to get this picture. This was the gentleman who got the first patent on a chili pick, picker, a Wondell Krieger. And this was back in 1971. This was one of the very first machines that he actually developed uh, to pick red chili. So currently, because of the work of our researchers, our growers, um, engineers, most of the red chili in paprika now is mechanically harvested. It's usually machines like this with a double helix. And that's because you, know, when you have red chili, you're going to dry it anyway. So if a machine beats it up, who cares? <laughs> you, know, you can take a little bit of beating without hurting yourself too much. Uh, with green chili, though, you know, as I mentioned, uh, green chili is very easily damaged. You know, once you damage it, since it's a very fresh, succulent fruit, it's going to quickly uh, rot and degrade. So we have to be a lot more uh, gentle with our green chili fruit. We don't want them to, looking like this. Also, it's really hard to make a good relleno out of this shredded, large <laughs> green chili fruit. So we, uh, we did start researching this, and uh, I'm really happy to say that I'm really proud of this. This was actually uh, the result of work in my program. Where in uh, t late 2020, we re released Numex Odyssey. If you see the prefix Numex, that means it's been a, a variety that was released by New Mexico State University. And Odyssey was actually bred uh, to be efficient for mechanical harvest. So we bred this, you know, in the same way that our, our ancestors were able to get that little chiltepine and make bell peppers out of it, long green chilies, many other pepper types. There's a lot of elasticity in chili pepper genetics. So we actually selected for something with a strong single stem so that the harvester could get under it. The fruit come off a little bit easier. And it's not a bushy type plant that would tend to be picked up by the machine. 
So this is being grown commercially for the first time this year, so we're hoping we finally got to the point we can uh, mechanize at least a part of our New Mexico chili. Because need let me up need some Odyssey seed. Okay. <laughs> So what's the, what's the future, and uh, I talked about the path, what's the future of the chili pepper industry here? What we do know, we still face a lot of competition from other countries. A lot of our production has gone down to Mexico, where labor is much, much um, more available, uh, less expensive. However, we're, we're working to uh, increase our technology so that we can keep chili acreage here. And I will say that even if our acreage has declined, I mean, Chile is still and will always be, you know, well entwined with the heart and soul of the state. So, <laughs> so that's not going to go away, even if our acreage drops a little bit. Uh, but this is my contact information, so please feel free to email me if you need more information about Chile. And I do apologize, I should have put up the Chile Pepper Institute website, it's just cpi.org. And like I said, there is an online store where we sell seed of many of these different New Mexico type chilies. Uh, people always tell us our seed's too expensive. It is expensive, but we're a nonprofit. This is how we support ourselves by, uh, by selling our seed and, uh, and such.